All right, then let's have a bit of analysis on this three country show. Eric Lobb is an associate professor at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Florida International University. He's joining us live on the program from Miami. Um, thank you for your time this evening. So what, what are your initial impressions of the outcomes from this three country tour by the Iranian president? Well, in terms of the outcomes beyond the statements, beyond the MOUs and agreements that are signed, the objective of the Iranians and of President Raisi is really to reset relations and salvage ties with the continent in the wake of his predecessor, having uh, Hassan Rouhani, having neglected the continent while focusing on the Iran nuclear deal. And then subsequently with African countries, particularly those in the Horn of Africa, having severed ties with Iran in 2016. So President Raisi wants to send a strong message and, and signal to these countries that Iran is serious about resetting these relations. I mean, signaling is one thing, but when it comes down to the brass tacks of it, right, it has to translate into something, you know, a lot more serious, trade, investment. So from where you sit, what are the potential areas of potential trade growth between Iran's $390 billion economy and the economies that we have here in Africa? Well, I think where we're going to see the most promise with trade is going to be with Kenya, which is even before the revolution of 1979 in Iran, has consistently ranked behind South Africa as Iran's second largest trading partner. Uh, Kenya exports tea, its largest global export to Iran, and then imports petroleum, carpets, chemicals and other products. So there you could see actually potential for increased trade. Uh, with Uganda and uh, Zimbabwe, there, there's less potential in the area of trade, given that Uganda has largely remained outside the top 10 and that Zimbabwe has always been very low on the list of Iran's trading partners in Africa. Indeed, I want to go back to something you said a little earlier, because looking at the numbers, the trade flow data um, from 2022, 2021, if you look at 2022, for example, goods exported by Iran into various economies here was barely 2% of the country's total exports that year, around $77 billion. So viewed, viewed from that lens, I mean, Africa doesn't look particularly strategically important for Iran. Well, in the area of trade, you're absolutely right. Uh, between the 1960s up until the 2000s, Iran's trade with Africa really stagnated around 2.5% during those years on average. And when you look at the trade data, actually, of African countries, Iran's regional rivals like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are much larger trading partners. So where Iran can make economic inroads is in other sectors as well. For example, car factories, tractor factories and production lines that it's opened up in countries like Uganda and Zimbabwe, as well as other areas of agricultural and industrial cooperation. For example, the extraterritorial cultivation that uh, we're seeing develop between Iran and Uganda for, uh, to improve Iran's food security in the uh, wake of desert desertification and drought. Indeed. I want to go back to the question around the competitive edge that Iran might bring to the table. Uh, when the, the president was in Zimbabwe, they signed an MOU to set up a tractor manufacturing plant. But in that particular area, I mean, countries like India, for example, manufacturers like Mahindra do have an edge. You've got developed logistical ties. Trading is not an issue as far as currencies are concerned. What does Iran need to do to close that gap? Well, what Iran could do, uh, you know, again, these these factories, these production lines have existed since 2008 in countries like uh, Zimbabwe and Uganda. So Iran does have some history there. It has long, fairly long standing relationships that it can leverage. Uh, it may also have a competitive advantage in terms of, of price. Uh, to some extent in terms of technology. But of course, it will face major constraints when going up against a larger country, a larger economy uh, with India that's less constrained by, by sanctions and other economic constraints. And that's why I actually want to wrap up this conversation on for, for at least two of these countries, right? Iran, Zimbabwe, they're both under a fair bit of sanctions from EU states, from the UK, from the United States. So in as much as they're talking about building trade, how capital for these investments easily move from point A to point B without triggering red flags? Well, on the one hand, I think countries like Iran and Zimbabwe that are already under sanctions have less to lose by engaging in these interactions, as we've seen with, with Iran and Russia and other countries that are under the sanctions regime. 
Uh, on the flip side, of course, it's going to increase transaction costs. And of course, it's going to limit what these countries can do in terms of investment and capital, not to mention the fact that in looking at, at World Bank rankings, Iran and these African countries are all in the low um, middle to, to low uh, income range, uh, low to middle to low income ranges. So um, again, we have to pay attention in our analysis to the uh, investment and capital related constraints that these countries are under, even just beyond sanctions and the economic challenges that they face.